Peter Molyneux's Twitter parody account, Peter Molyneux, has its own entry on Wikipedia. Did you know that? That fact is utterly amazing to me. In a world of largely faceless people, there's this one man, this one games designer, who's so famous and so well known that the existence of a joke account that spouts ludicrous game ideas in the classic Molyneux style will be preserved forever on the world's most popular information resource. When we're all gone, the aliens will download the whole of Wikipedia, and they'll be able to find out about Peter Molyneux themselves. Oh, and Jimmy Wells will still be at the top, in the 26,000th year of his Bitcoin donation drive. To cover Molyneux is an intimidating task. Where do you even start? What do you come up with? And, well, what's your goal? The easy thing to do would be to make something that reflects whatever the popular consensus is on Molyneux at the time, which likely now more than ever wouldn't be very positive. It would be so easy to present all the events and to conclude the video by saying that Molyneux is one of gaming's biggest and greatest chances, to say that Molyneux was once someone great but fell into obscurity and conmanship, or even to say that actually, just how great were Molyneux's best games? Maybe they weren't any good after all. However, I would find that hard to do, seeing as he's the man behind some of my favourite games, who controlled a studio that defined gaming for me, one of the first people in gaming who I was aware of, and admired. So no, I'm not here to scorch Peter Molyneux. I'm here to look at what he's done and be a bit fairer about it, almost to document and appraise his work, in as best way as I can in a YouTube video and also to examine the way he goes about talking to the press, the people that he hires and so forth. And in doing so, perhaps I'll find the answer to some questions. How much of it was passion and how much was bullshit? Just what drove him? And when all's said and done, what is Peter Molyneux's legacy? There's no easy answer to any of those. And yeah, it will take a long time. It's going to be three parts, I imagine. As one of the most important figures in the history of British computer games, and indeed computer games as a whole over the last 25 years, he deserves that. And so, this is the story of God, or not. Peter Douglas Molyneux, OBE. The story goes that Molyneux first tried to break into games with something called the Entrepreneur in 1984. Caught up in the bedroom coder boom, he was utterly convinced that this text-based business simulator would be a massive hit. I've cut a bigger post box in front of my front door. I sat by the, the post box waiting to hear this truck turn up with you know tens of thousands of orders. It wasn't. And according to Peter, he only sold two copies of it, one of them being to his mum. It's so obscure that no one seems to know what system it was even made for, although I imagine it was for the C64. Defeated, he left game design forever and settled for a career selling baked beans. No, really. Until one day, Commodore gave him a call, mistaking the baked beans company, Taurus, with the company Taurus, with the letter O that specialised in networking software. The upshot of all of this is that Molyneux stumbled upon the greatest business deal he would ever do. Commodore would provide Taurus and Molyneux 10 free Amigas for porting over the networking software that he didn't do. There was like an angel and a devil on my shoulders, and one saying, go on, you've just got to tell the truth, you know, you can't lie like this. And then this other voice saying, just lie, just lie, get the machines, go to the stand space and just sort it out afterwards. Of course, I ended up lying. The understanding was soon cleared up, but Taurus made a database program for the Amiga and, more important than that, they had some computers. An interesting story. I do sometimes wonder about some of the details, particularly anything that involves Commodore giving things away for free, but hey ho. The database and the computers are what allowed Molyneux and his business partner, Les Edgar, to form Bullfrog Productions in 1987, Les handling the admin side, and Molyneux the games designer, heading up a handful of people or so in the heart of Guildford, in Surrey. These are the first available games that Molyneux worked on as a designer, a port of a gauntlet clone called Druid 2, and Fusion, a shoot-em-up of all things. 
There's nothing wrong with these games, but it has to be said that there are few first games that are more misleading than these ones. To say the least, they were humble, some would even say average, beginnings, but they got Bullfrog's feet on the ground. Molyneux's heart was never at any point with games like these. He envisioned something more ambitious, where you were, well, a god. Populous apparently was first inspired by the work of an artist at Bullfrog, one Glenn Corpse, who was idly building isometric blocks one day having played David Braben's Virus. Molyneux being Molyneux, one isometric block was enough to set his world afire. Populous as a game evolved rather than being designed, I think my first thought was let's create a little world and have these little people moving around this little world. He developed an isometric landscape, made some little people or peeps to potter around it and watch them play. The game changing mechanic, being able to raise and lower terrain, was developed simply because doing that would make it easier for the peeps to move around. Populous was born out of my incompetence as a programmer. This is the absolute truth of it. I thought, why don't I just get the player to flatten the land? So I had them just build a little land and just wander around the shore, and that gave rise to the, this thing called exploration and that they could explore, and that was because I wasn't smart enough to do, to do the code. The next idea was that if the peeps found enough flat terrain, they'd build houses, which would allow them to expand and grow in number. Finally, the game had an aim. There would be another side, also changing the land and expanding their peeps, and the two sides would eventually fight. The side with the most peeps would very likely win. We play it almost every day, and then that night I'd refine the game in such a way so it would be to my advantage. So I think I won every single game, because I used to effectively cheat and refine all the rules. And so this is how Molyneux created the God Game. It should be noted that a God Game is a little misunderstood sometimes as a genre. It is not necessarily a sandbox game where you can do anything you want. There are walls and restrictions and there is a goal to achieve, that of beating the other side. But rather than achieving it through directly controlling the people on the ground, which you never do in Populous, you achieve it through, well, divine intervention, creating the ideal space for the peeps to grow and achieve their goals. The peeps are your followers and the more they grow, the more mana you earn which you can use for special god powers like creating volcanoes, causing earthquakes or, most important of all, turning people into knights. There's a balancing act. You can terraform the land to give your peeps space to grow, but you can also meddle with the opponent's land, or build up defences with hills and water. You have much more freedom in something like Civilization than you do in Populous, but Civ is not a god game. The god game in this form is more like a different approach to real-time strategy. So with the concept created, and famously recreated in LEGO to show off to press folks, the team built world after world. The original populace consisted of 500 levels where two gods could go at it. If you were ever dedicated enough to beat the 500th level, you would be greeted with a single screen text based ending, because it was only right at the end of the development that the team realised that they'd forgot to code an ending into the game. Populous is such a huge and influential game that I could easily spend another 30 minutes talking about it, but there's no time for that. I don't mean to gloss over it at all by just telling you how the game works, but that's the important bit. These same building blocks cover not just this game, but a lot of other Molyneux games. The game itself was, of course, massive. It was something completely new that received 90% plus scores from every mag going, and a big success for Bullfrog and the game's publisher, Electronic Arts. And I got this phone call three weeks after it was released from one of the chief people at Electronic Arts, and he said, um, how's it feel to be a millionaire? And honestly, it deserved all of them. Populous was and is lots of fun. You are, after all, a god who can completely screw up the entire world with a flood, if you please. What's not to love about it? Populous is amazing, and even if you're not in control of the action on the ground as you would normally be, it's no less addictive for that. 
It's the game that put Bullfrog on the map, it was even ported to consoles, and it is rightly an influential game. It created a whole new genre. Not bad going, to be honest. And it does set out one certain aim for Molyneux that he has with just about all of his games. Molyneux always wants to create something new. In putting Bullfrog on the map, Populous put Peter Molyneux on the map too. Never at any point was Molyneux standing on the sidelines, he was always front and centre. The first in-depth Molyneux print interview might just be here. A big company profile of Bullfrog and their projects in the September 1989 issue of The One. The tone is slightly incredulous, as if Gary Ritter can't believe that this team can produce all the unnamed projects they're being coy about, almost as if Populous was just a fluke. The feature covers three games, all of which did come out. Project W was a Peter Molyneux-led project, released in 1990 as Powermonger. Project F was a platformer called Flood. And then there's Project X, for which very little is set, but that would come out too. More on that later. Indeed, the only game covered in depth here that didn't make it was the one that had a name, Glen Corpse's Creation, which we'll get to soon. The most interesting thing about the feature is seeing the team, and just how young they are, even for a team of coders and graphic designers. One of them, Sean Cooper, wasn't even 20 years old and had come from a YTS scheme. Now he was working on Flood. Um, it, was this, it was as if he came in and said, give us one of your guys, and then left again, and then I was sent round to his offices. And I had to, first of all, I had to find his address, which was yeah, um, above a hi-fi shop. And then um, I rang the buzzer and no, no one answered. <laughs> and I rang it again and no one answered still. So I was outside for like 10 minutes and then someone answered. And, hello? I said, hello, it's Sean. Who? Sean. And it went silent and then for five minutes no one let me in. So I just thought, oh, actually they don't want me anymore. Molyneux was the win leader, and for him it almost seemed as if the bedroom coder days never ended. In a later interview, he said that he would rather take on young and inexperienced people with good ideas than battle-hardened vets. He even said that he could teach someone to program in two weeks, disregarding its importance. However close to the truth that might have been, the team were never short of work. But seriously, how on earth are these young upstarts going to follow Populous? To their credit, they did so with hit upon hit. Here's the next Molyneux game, Powermonger. A relatively early RTS with exciting 3D terrain and a memorable display. The map, complete with massive generals looking at you menacingly, always made the game look fascinating in magazines. It is kind of based on populous, but being an RTS you have a lot more direct control over your troops. As far as playing it goes, there are probably better RTS games and it is quite hard to understand, but this was certainly something that increased the genre's scope. I made the fatal mistake of having a good idea, programming that idea up, and actually releasing it without ever really playing it. Flood, meanwhile, is a different kettle of fish, an odd platformer that's based around the realistic implementation of water in a game, slowly trickling down and flooding the level. As mentioned, Sean Cooper was one of the main people behind this one, and his next game would be an altogether different matter. Both of these games got great reviews and sold well to boot, adding more to Bullfrog's reputation. Just like Populous, Powermonger ended up getting ported to other platforms, including the Mega Drive. Being with the system's top third-party publisher obviously helps with that, mind you. Still, Bullfrog games were already going far beyond the reaches of the Amiga, even at this early stage. Smash cuts to the June 1991 second issue of Amiga Power, where the front cover says it all. Even in games magazines, it's rare for a designer to find themselves front and centre, but then there hadn't been any designer up to this point who was as welcoming to the press as Molyneux was, and this is one of his greatest early achievements. This five-page feature is triumphant. Bullfrog, Molyneux and the still tiny team are officially Amiga Boys done good and recognised the world over, much like the bitmaps and Sensible. Creation, at this stage, still seemed to be coming along okay, but the real exciting portion is Sean Cooper's game. Bob, or Higher Functions, 
a game where you, as a head of a corporation, control cyborgs and get them to do your bidding. Can you guess what it is yet? If you want a justification for Molyneux's policy of hiring the young and inexperienced, look no further than Sean Cooper, the then 20-year-old XYTS coder who would go on to head up Syndicate, perhaps Bullfrog's greatest game and one of the darkest, most nihilistic, most gripping and flat-out brilliant games ever made. Naturally, we'll be seeing a bit more on that later. Or how about Demi Hasabi? a later hire who would co-design and do the lead programming on Theme Park when he was just 18 years old. He hadn't even finished his computer science degree yet, but Molyneux knew a prodigy when he saw one. So what was it like working there, anyway? According to most, it was, in all honesty, a pretty great time. It goes without saying that it was a boys club where people worked hard and played hard, but they were usually doing so out of passion and love, working on games for long hours because that was what they wanted to do, not because there was a crunch. When you were at Bullfrog, there literally wasn't anything else for you except Bullfrog. I was next to a, a fire, an old fireplace, with roosting pigeons that used to crap down the fireplace and splatter up my leg. <laughs> so at the end of the day, I had bird shit all down my leg. It was, it was really glamorous. Um, Molyneux himself? Easy going and approachable as a boss in ways, but determined and with a very powerful skill, an undoubted gift of the gap. If you look over the Amiga Power interview, all the Molyneuxisms are already in place. He almost plays with interviewers, welcoming but coy and always obtuse, but his passion is never questioned. Nobody can sell a game like Peter Molyneux can, and that wasn't just to advertisers, but also to his team. He had such drive and passion towards his products that he always had this certain vision for them, and while that was open to other people, it could cause some other people within his purview to bristle a bit at times. There are some people who tend to dip in and out of the Molyneux empire because of this. Um, it just looked at theme parks, I can't, who's going to play this? This is like a kid's game. So I quit, one of my many strops in my time. He encouraged creativity at Bullfrog and never favoured experience. He made it policy to always stop everything and meet on Friday afternoons, just so everyone could exchange their latest ideas. It's a tough one to pin down. Molyneux might not have been the boss as such, but he was undoubtedly the leader. He'd have this sort of the same shirt on every day and he'd be hunched over his computer with a, with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth and there'd be cigarette ash all over his computer. And so, finally, it was time for the big one at the end of 1991. The sequel to one of the Amiga's most famous games would, more than anything at this point, decide Bullfrog's fate. If Populous 2 were a hit, then it would probably be safe to say that Bullfrog were the biggest and best thing going on the whole of the Amiga. To show once and for all that there was nothing fluky about them by making a great follow-up to their premier title. I've waited until the sequel to go a bit more in-depth about Populous, because while the original was so good and so groundbreaking, Populous 2 Trials of the Olympian Gods feels like the true finished version. Seriously, what a sequel. You have a consistent ancient Greek theme, and the ability to customise your deity and increase his skills. You have an instantly usable and streamlined interface. It's not the book from the original, but it moves so smoothly. There's new, handy options like Armageddon, which allows you to drop everything and just go straight to an all-out battle to the death, as well as new heroes with more abilities than the original game's knights. Everything great about the first game is here, but better in every way and it's one of the best sequels ever made. There is an argument to be made that Molyneux, as a games designer, never got higher than Populous, that he started at the top and has been working his way down ever since. It's rare for someone to create something so new, yet so intuitive and, well, just so all-out fun and addictive and filled to the brim with personality. Populous 2 is just as it was in 1991, an absolutely essential game that must be played, and one of the Amiga's greatest games. In the end, Populous 2 was a triumph, more 90% scores, not a single score below that from any Amiga magazine, in fact. It's a classic victory lap sequel, the game just needed to be a triumph, and with that it was clear that Bullfrog had already won. 
And this is before we get to Syndicate and Theme Park. This is before we even see a bunch of the stuff that ended up never being released. Bullfrog Productions were at this stage on a truly amazing one, and it would only get better. After all, it wasn't just Molyneux. One of the most important things to note about the man is just how much talent, in a way, he ended up nurturing. And a look at Bullfrog would be incomplete without properly seeing the two games that came from the studio's most apt pupils. First up, Sean Cooper. He joined Bullfrog on a YTS, or Youth Training Scheme, which if you don't know, was basically a training course for school leavers back in the late 80s, early 90s. Or alternately, a way for employers to get someone to make the tea for less than peanuts. Famously, the doomed character in the classic specky joke game Advanced Lawnmower Simulator is a YTS junior gardener. And that was most folks on YTS, only without the death. I was helping out a lot of people and we were building, we started building games and different pieces of software and just basically mucking about trying to learn stuff and that's when Peter came, Peter Molyneux came in. Anyway, I digress. Sean Cooper joined Bullfrog and now he was about to make one of the greatest games ever made. Syndicate evolved from being people screwing about with AI and thinking of ways that they could batter each other, into a futuristic cyberpunk world domination simulator and strategic shooter, where teams of agents do horrible things to cities. Brutal assassinations, mind control, sprawling gunfights where innocents get caught in the crossfire. Syndicate is not a nice game. It's one of the creepiest and most atmospheric games ever made, in 1993, you almost never saw a living, breathing city in games, let alone something like this in the Blade Runner and Neuromancer mould. Every mission is immaculately designed and brings a new challenge to the table as your agents get stronger and stronger. There's so many ways to complete objectives and some of them are just so won. This isn't merry Grand Theft Auto mayhem, this is Harry Limes scoffing at any compassion you might feel for those dots down there. It's… scary. And the best way I can convey this is to, without comment, show you the story of Special Agent Bush. I feel it's necessary to point out that the actions in this story are not something that I condone in any way. This is merely a demonstration of one possibility that the game Syndicate offers, of many. I should also note that this section comes with a content warning, and if you want to skip it, then please click that annotation below. Thank you. Yes, that is something you can do in Syndicate. With your own mind. I could talk about this game for hours. Many hours. One day I probably will. For now I'll have to move on and just say that it is, quite simply, Bullfrog's greatest achievement. A game unlike any other, and one that I approach with, I must say, a certain alarm. Demi Hasabi, the other man in question here, was, as I mentioned, a prodigy. By the time he was 13, he was already a chess master. Demi was hired by Bullfrog when he was a mere 16 years old and started off by designing levels on Syndicate, before lead programming and co-designing Theme Park the very next year with Molyneux. And um, the idea of the game was that you um, designed your own Disney World 
and thousands of little people with their own desires and characteristics um, came into that Disney World and judged and decided how much fun they had in your theme park. And then if they would go and tell their friends and they would come the next day. I've already done a review on theme park on this channel, but I'll sum up my thoughts briefly. The brilliance of the original theme park doesn't merely lie in the wonder of building your very own land where kids have a magical day out, it lied in combining that with fleecing those kids for every single penny they had, all the joys of ruthless capitalism. Theme Park was Bullfrog's most hardcore simulator to date, a game that reveled in tiny details and signature Molyneux touches, like it being a genius move to, say, put up a chip stand, jack up the salt content, and then stick a cola stand next to it, watered down with ice cubes, obviously. And if you sell strong coffee, then your customers will move around the park like grease lightning. Theme Park is one of the most penny-pinching games ever. You build a glorious roller coaster, and at the same time you water down the beer and make it virtually impossible to win on the coconut shy, all the while paying your staff peanuts. It's almost comic that the best way to earn money in Theme Park is by being an asshole boss. It really is. You almost don't realise that you're doing it. These two games were, of course, huge hits. Two of the most famous games ever to come out for the Amiga, in fact. You don't really need me to tell you what the general opinion on Peter Molyneux was back then. He was revered, a sun god, for some people he might have been the best games designer in the world at the time, and the rest of his studio could match him. Bullfrog were right up at the top of the tree. And really, you can't argue with his track record. By 1994, Molyneux himself had been heavily involved with three all-time classic games, and virtually everything that Bullfrog had made since Populous was golden. I posed the fake question earlier on, the one supposing that maybe Molyneux's best stuff was never truly great, the one posed by people who'd wonder how on earth Molyneux ever got such status. For the answer you just need to look at the legacy of his first company. Even without the games, the creative freedom and ideas that Molyneux inspired at Bullfrog would be something special. But <laughs> who boy did they have the games. Every single game that they released on the Amiga, after Populous, would end up being acclaimed as amongst the best to come out on the machine. But perhaps one more loose end needs to be tied up. Remember Project X? It didn't end with that first interview. In the aforementioned issue of Amiga Power, there was a competition to actually win a job at Bullfrog, and not just making the tease or testing the games, as a fully-fledged programmer who would work on the top secret Project X. The task was to code a unique variation on Space Invaders. It would take a while, but the results would finally be announced in the August 1992 issue. The winner was Mr. Wobbly Leg vs. the Invaders from Space, and the coder was a certain Mr. Mike Diskett, who would go on to head up Syndicate Wars. I made Syndicate Wars 15 years ago, back when I had a full head of hair. He also did the original programming on Project X. So what do you think this project was, having put everything together? Well done if you guessed Theme Park. It was a pet project of Molyneux for quite a while. Diskit, along with the man himself and Hasabi, was instrumental in finally bringing it to being, doing a lot of the coding on the game. And it all started with a competition in Amiga Power. And so, that's the legacy of Bullfrog Productions, arguably the most exciting and flat-out greatest team of coders in the history of the Amiga. Certainly the youngest, a truly glorious time that some would argue was the pinnacle of Peter Molyneux's career. Next, we see how the glory days of Bullfrog came to an end. Theme Park would be Bullfrog's final Amiga game. They were one of many who decided to, at last, leave the system behind. They would hit the ground running on the PC with 1994's Magic Carpet. Led by Mark Huntley and Sean Cooper, one of the first third-person 3D games out there, brought into existence through lots of lovely voxel. It's an odd game. You'd think it hasn't held up because it's a 3D game from 1994, but in a way it has, because I can't think of much else like it. 
It's a very open-ended game where you, a wizard, try to collect mana while protecting balloons that collect mana from dead enemies and other sources. Collecting mana builds the castle, and once the castle is built you've completed the world. Simple. Once you figure it out anyways. It does work well as a just screw around and shoot things game, especially because this 3D game from 1994 actually has destructible terrain. And after enough blasting with enough patience, you'll figure it out. I also really like this old Games Master segment where Dave Games Animal Perry, presumably reading from a Molyneux script, proposes a far out idea that combines magic carpet with that old chestnut, Creation. Still hyped five years on. Like a flight sim carpet and um, you're shooting all these monsters that are coming at you from the sea and everything and all of a sudden you're getting bored, you've been playing it for a couple of hours and so just by dipping the carpet towards the sea you suddenly enter a completely different game called Creation which is set under the sea and as long as that game is stored on your hard drive there's no need to reload the game or anything, the computer instantly recognises the instruction and puts you straight into the new game. It's not my favourite Bullfrog game but Magic Carpet's certainly fun enough, and yes it was another huge hit. It's one of the games that people most readily associate with Bullfrog, in fact. Whether it was 2D or 3D, the company was going from strength to strength. Behind the scenes however there were lots of things that were changing. There is such a thing called the Molyneux Cycle, coined by Jim Sterling as a shorthand for the extravagant promises that tend to be made during the hype period for one of his studio's games, which are then frequently not met. We'll get into that later, but I would like to introduce a second Molyneux cycle to describe his time with various companies. And it all started with Bullfrog and their main publisher, Electronic Arts. Molyneux's gift of the gab allowed him to become very close with other companies while still at the head of his own flagship. Bullfrog weren't just a company that published games for EA, they were essential to their vision going forward. And Molyneux himself was just as essential to that vision. One day, the phone started to ring, and there were all these big, big companies saying, look, if you ever want to sell your company, we're really interested in buying it. We're going to take you out to, to dinner, or we're going to fly you to this resort, and it was like being a rock star. And so the relationship between EA and Bullfrog would get ever closer. In 1992, EA bought a significant amount of shares in the company. At the start of 1995, this led to EA acquiring Bullfrog all out. However, unlike many other EA software house acquisitions, Molyneux remained as the company's head. More than that, Molyneux was now a vice president at EA, giving him who knows how many other hats and responsibilities, and that meant that he would also consult and help out with other companies and divisions under the EA umbrella. But still, the main one for him was overseeing Bullfrog. It was a vast sum of money. This group of people were getting a little bit impatient, you know, there was nowhere for them, to, for lots of them to grow. Selling out to Electron Cars, who were really, really passionate about the games that we, we made, just seemed like the, really the right thing to do. So what happens next? Well, even if the culture around the office might change a little thanks to big overarching companies with their marketing and their HR and what have you, Business at Bullfrog for the next couple of years appears to be as good as ever. More arcade based games such as the sequel to Magic Carpet and the popular sci-fi racer High Octane are released in 1995. There is another strategy game that's perhaps not as famous as a lot of other Bullfrogs called Gene Wars which isn't as well received as some of the other games but does have its fans. The aforementioned Syndicate Wars arrives in 1996, the sequel to perhaps Bullfrog's greatest game, at least in my opinion. That's something of a tall order, especially seeing as the game is 3D to boot, but the result is certainly worthy of the name, complete with a level of destruction that honestly hadn't been seen in any game up to that point. It's not as good as the original, the 3D graphics haven't aged well and it'll never be as scary a game again, but Syndicate Wars is still another really fun strategic blow everything up and destroy all cities shooter. It's pretty damn fantastic. And in the midst of all this Molyneux finds time to head up another game, 1997's Dungeon Keeper. A game with a simple enough concept, what if you were in charge of all of those dungeons that the hero has to beat? Haven't you ever thought that you could do a better job of designing them and keeping heroes at bay? It sounds great, and it largely is. A new and altogether fiendish take on simulation, where you can slap your workers into shape and imprison enemies at your leisure. 
It is kind of dank, but easy enough to understand and play. It's a lot easier to control lists than it is Syndicate Wars, has to be said. Molyneux's design was still very strong despite all his new responsibilities. However, Dungeon Keeper was delayed and Molly had to fund a significant amount of the development out of his own pocket in order to keep EA from killing it. We were locked up in his house for a period of time, but we had great fun because we'd play each other in the night. Okay, Peter would say, ah, oh, it's a design flaw when he lost and changed the game so it was altered around. Still, the game was released to another big round of applause and plenty of sales to boot. It did absolutely brilliantly. And lastly in this little roundup, we have another absolute barnstormer, Theme Hospital from March 1997. It's like Theme Park only this time, set in a hospital, which doesn't necessarily appeal to some of Bullfrog's vets. All Peter said was it's called Theme Hospital, so I thought, great, it's even worse than the game I left for in the first place. <laughs> ah well, never mind Gary, Theme Hospital is fantastic. There's a big satirical bent, an almost absurd carry on doctor a -thon mood to the whole thing where you are in charge of healing the sick and usually failing. But with this game, it was clear that Bullfrog's themes, where you build a world and those little people fill it with their own desires, that could work anywhere. It didn't just have to be in an amusement park, it could be in something as mundane as a hospital. This was and is by far the most successful game that Bullfrog ever made. I think it's sold some ridiculous number, I think it's about 9 million uh, copies on the PC alone, so I'm quite proud of this one, this is one big tick of the games that I'm really pleased I worked on. Theme Hospital improved on the formula in every way, and it's right up there with the original, Syndicate and Populous 2, one of the studio's very best games. And alas, their last game that would come close to reaching that sort of level. It is usually around this time, a couple of years down the road, that the Molyneux cycle enters its second half. Quite simply, well, Peter Molyneux tends to get a bit bored. He feels as though he's not really in charge anymore. He yearns to get back to the way things once were. Smaller but more creative teams with people he can supervise and talents he can nurture. He himself wants to get his head fully back into game design, as he tires of his more executive and onerous duties as vice president of wherever. And so, even though things are at this point going very well indeed, in August of 1997, to the shock of just about everyone, Peter Molyneux leaves EA, and with it he leaves Bullfrog, the company that he created, with a heavy heart. Various Bullfrog alumni will eventually ride with him again, but suddenly Bullfrog is without its leader. I went to the president of Electronic Arts and I said, look, this is my problem. You know, I'm not doing the job I love. I can either go back to being a designer, which was taking this huge step backwards, or I could leave, set up another company and publish my games through Electronic Arts. And that is exactly what uh, I did. Does any of this sound familiar so far? It is the same scenario that would play out many years later with Lionhead, although with the odd difference in circumstance. It's certainly a tough situation for Bullfrog because while there are so many brilliant and creative people working at Bullfrog, for many Bullfrog was Peter Molyneux. He's not the only one to leave Bullfrog around this time. Mike Diskett, creator of Syndicate Wars and winner of that Amiga Power competition, leaves alongside Gary Carr and a bunch of others to form Muckyfoot Productions, the creators of Startopia. An exodus continues over the next couple of years. Glenn Corps forms Lost Toys in 1999, Simon and Dean Carter form Big Blue Box, and that won't be the last time you'll hear that name, and there would be plenty more. All of the companies, including Molyneux's new one, would stay in Guildford, which had the side effect of making Guildford one of the UK's top places for video game development. And of course, other Bullfrog alumni, such as programmer Mark Webley, leave to join Molyneux on his new adventure, many miles away. Okay, just down the road in Pete's mansion, for that is where his new company, Lionhead Studios, would be born. Molyneux could also count on the return in, at least for a short time, of prodigal AI genius Demi Hasabi. Company co-founder Les Edgar, now also an executive at EA, would stay on. And if anyone was to be Molyneux's creative replacement, it would be Sean Cooper. Having actually left Bullfrog in 1996 after a dispute with Molyneux, Cooper took his departure as an opportunity to return. Bullfrog's later years are a mixed bag. 
At first, Finn still appeared okay. Projects that were started under Molyneux were finished, and other games still appear to be good, or at least successful. There's a new Populous called Populous The Beginning that can actually still be played online to this very day thanks to the fans, but didn't go down as well with fans of the original, and Dungeon Keeper 2, complete with its, um, very 1999 indeed box art, but still a good game with Cooper at the helm instead of Molyneux. However, the big warning sign was 1999's Theme Park World. Mainly because it was not satirical at all, it was in fact quite casual, and frankly it wasn't very good. Certainly not when compared to the infinitely better Roller Coaster Tycoon. It's this one title that's not very good that makes you see a bigger problem. Suddenly, all that Bullfrog are producing are direct sequels to their older products. While Dungeon Keeper 2 was a very good sequel indeed, Populous The Beginning was, well, eh, it's okay, and Theme Park World, well, compared to the original and Theme Hospital, not only was it rubbish, it was also one thing that Bullfrog Games hadn't been. It was boring and generic. And so this is the final part of the Molyneux Company cycle, what happens to the company in question after his departure. Molyneux's other hidden strength as a boss becomes clear. He is very skilled at keeping his flagship company away from all the shitty stuff that comes from being under a bigger company's empire, usually thanks to his high standing in said empire. With Molyneux gone, Bullfrog are suddenly no longer immune from executive meddling. And what do you know? Suddenly you're making endless sequels to Theme Park and… and original projects just don't happen anymore. Creation, a project that was originally named all the way back in that 1989 interview in The One, is one of the most notable casualties. The idea itself, featuring a world that's mostly underwater, and a caretaker in charge of a tiny aquatic population that needs to survive and thrive, was great and hyped up quite a lot, it even had a trailer released in 1995, but in the end, despite everything, it was cancelled in 1997 in the most pragmatic fashion. Four words. Sub-games don't sell. The Indestructibles was another major project that bit the dust, this time in 1996. You control a superhero in a 1900s world that almost sounds like a sandbox where you can chuck cars around, deform the landscape, and battle enemies. It sounds like Crackdown on the Xbox 360, only five years before the release of Grand Theft Auto 3. Alas, it never made it. Various other projects didn't make it, including more theme games that weren't based around amusement parks, and mysterious titles like Void Star and Genesis The Hand of God. Alas, Theme Park World and Theme Park Inc., they all did make it. Fortunately, Bullfrog's End wasn't all that drawn out. In 2001, EA decided to fold the company into EA UK, finishing off Bullfrog Productions. Les Edgar was already gone by this point, out of EA and eventually out of the industry. He's now the chairman of resurrected UK sports car manufacturers TVR. Sean Cooper left the picture but stayed in the EA fold, working heavily on James Bond 007 Everything and Nothing and, oh jeez, the Godfather game. It must be said that the limitless psychopathic loan shark potential of this game makes a lot more sense when you consider that the man behind Syndicate was heavily involved. Anyway, he would move on to the casual market after EA, and he stayed there until recently. Occasionally, EA made noise about the UK studio resurrecting old Bullfrog titles, but for the most part, this basically never happened, and the studio were most famous for Harry Potter times before being closed completely in 2011, by which time they were known as EA Bright Light. No matter, Bullfrog's story had ended 10 years previously, and despite the shaky end, they are still one of the greatest companies ever to grace gaming as a whole, let alone just from the UK, with a ratio of classic and just flat out unique games that very few studios can match. They already had this reputation in 1997, when Peter Molyneux left, and with his next company, people were wondering if he could do the same thing over again. Thanks so much once again for watching this, the first part of the rise and fall of Peter Molyneux. 
If you liked this then please consider subscribing, please consider also following me on my social media or even supporting me on Patreon which is always very very welcome indeed. Anywho, let's get down to the old thank yous. First we have those Sinson ones. Uh, yeah, sort of trying to do the syndicate theme there. Anyway, here's some more. Tim Lintz, Robert Kelly, Paul Street, Stuart Ashen, Lee Harris, Tiago Pereira dos Santos Silva dos Santos Silva, James Id, Mike Siegler, Mike Spooner, Edge Reader, Russell Hugo, Ken Barraclough, Mark Johnson, Gerard Morris, Scott Coulter, Paolo Leary, Graham Kamak, Scott Mitten, Nicole Ketchum, Mark Brooks, Ninth Demon, Peter Sidorn, Ludwig Holmström, John Ezell, Kit Leary, L. O'Brien, Dave Parkinson, Novel, and Olaf Olbein. Thank you all so very much for your continued, thoroughly awesome support. I love you all. So in the second part we shall be covering Lionhead Studios, do please tune in flat. For now though, I shall say as ever, wherever you are and whoever you be, have a good one, take care, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now! <laughs>